going to be entirely pragmatic. I am the person in my faculty who was tasked with delivering the REF 2014 first set of impact case studies. So it might help you to know that we are by a long way the largest faculty of English in the UK. Uh, and the number of impact case studies that you have to submit for the research excellence framework is a proportion of your staff that you're putting in. So we had the uh, challenging um, position, we were in the challenging position of having to put in 10 case studies. In fact, we thought until the very last minute that it would be 11, but two of our postdocs then got um, permanent jobs in other universities, so we lost them. <laughs> so having put a colleague through two years of preparation, we had to stand one of them down um, at the very last minute. Uh, so it's tricky. We prepared 13. Um, in order to yield that final 10 um, and we simply decided at the a late stage which were the most viable, um, the best evidenced of them. So I'm going to talk you through the two that have the closest relation to digital humanities. Um, they're deliberately unlike projects. The first of them is really an individual researcher with expertise in one field, um, Jane Austen studies. I'm going to circulate these because as you will see these are quite long documents. If you've not, how, how many of you have seen a REF impact case study before? Okay, so minority. So do circulate them. I'm obviously not going to read or take you through all of them. I'm going to just fill it out, the bits that um, matter uh, in the process of writing. So the first, as I say, is an individual researcher with expertise in Jane Austen, and the task was to show what impact that work had had um, within the higher education sector, but probably more importantly, further afield with the general public. Um, and the second one is an open educational resources project, which I'll circulate a little bit later. Now, before I start on the Jane Austen one, let me just take you through. Um, what I've done here is to draw up a list of the kinds of impact typically claimed for the arts and humanities. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm simply not competent to do the social sciences meaningfully, so I'm going to pull you across to the humanistic wing of what you're doing a little. Um, I've added to them because in the process of writing these it seemed to me we needed slightly more refined claims and the ones that people were expecting were not necessarily the ones that were most useful to us. So the first of them is generating new ways of thinking that influence creative practice. Okay, so that you would show, for example, in one of the case studies, the one we stood down, in fact, that research into medieval romance had influenced a theatre troupe which had produced a series of, of productions based on those romances and retold those stories, bringing them to new audiences. Creating, inspiring and supporting new forms of artistic, literary, linguistic, social, economic, religious and other expression. Clearly a broader version of, of the above claim. Contributing to economic prosperity via the creative sector and a list of um, venues or methods through which you might hope or expect to be doing that informing or, or influencing practice or policy. Uh, and you had some timely words this morning about how difficult that one is to secure. I'll come back to it in a minute. Um, but we had a steer from the UK government on the areas in which they might be expecting or hoping to see humanistic influence there. So the religious, religious sexual, ethnic and linguistic discrimination tag belongs to that. Mm -hmm. Another of the case studies that we drew up was based on Deborah Cameron's work on gender differentiation in language and how it plays out in the, in the Venus versus Mars debate. Um, changing public understanding of a particular cultural object or practice or its significance then bringing a cultural object or practices to new audiences. That's obviously a claim for reach, and one of the things that's happening in the sector, as you'll be well aware, is that there is increased pressure to differentiate between the reach, the breadth of the audiences that you're, you're bringing in, and the impact itself. Um, preserving, conserving, and presenting or representing cultural heritage. Helping professionals and or organizations adapt to changing cultural conditions and or values. Okay, so for example, one we did on aging the aging society that was particularly relevant for. And then the educational ones, influencing the content of curricula and syllabi mm -hmm. at other higher education institutions um, through clearly publications, derived textbooks, new primary sources or an IT resource. Enhancing delivery, and that's actually the one I came to rely on the most, enhancing the delivery of an existing curriculum mm -hmm. by bringing new materials to the teachers or to the students. Uh, taking education beyond existing institutions of education okay, in ways that assist lifelong learning or the learning of individuals and groups who would normally fall outside um, those institutions. And then these are the ones I've drawn up for you on digital humanities specifically. I should say I'm very happy to make these slides available through Juliana if there are any use to you at the end. 
uh, creating new forms of digital conservation and or interpretation of cultural objects and practices, establishing new standards. Now this was, we should have um, seen this coming maybe, but that turned out to be immensely helpful. The, pr the feedback loop by which you are actually enhancing that process of digitization and, and the standards to which it aspires. Was, was really important, so it was, it's a little bit like your what is the impact of our impact workshop, but in what ways is the process of digitising, in this case Jane Austen manuscripts, assisting standards of, um, of the technology itself. Enhancing public access to and engagement with national or private collections, and then this is another of my added in one, producing integrated virtual collections that wouldn't otherwise be available as a whole, okay, and the kinds of work that that makes available. Right, so, so doing something to compensate for the dispersal of materials that has obviously happened in cultural life. Right, let me take you through the Jane Austen one. So the scenario from which I start is that I have a very distinguished colleague, professor, she's now just retired, you may know her work or have heard of it, um, who I know, so the position from which I start is that I know her to be a terrific writer on Jane Austen. I've used her work myself in teaching but I haven't a clue how to go about, at the beginning, making the claims for her. And I'll say that a policy decision we made within our faculty wasn't consistent across our university, was that we would have one person writing all the case studies. Because the process of devolving it to each individual was, it's, it's just about labour really. It's about there being a particular genre you're being asked to write, a particular process you're going through, and it seemed to us a, onerous, but B, much worse if you put everybody through that and then have to deal with the different psychologies, the different competences, the time available to people. It was just more efficient in the end to have one person doing it. So you sit down and you have a conversation. But something I'd like to put up front is I think a case study is only going to be as good in academia and it may be that there will be differences here. There probably are if you're dealing with a larger civic project or even a museum or children's education, but in the higher education sector, I really think it matters to just spend the time reading the work at the beginning and figuring out what the intellectual grit in it is. So when I sat down with Catherine really at the beginning, we figured out that there was a set of claims we're going to make. So let me just actually, before I start on it, let me just make sure that you've registered the, the format of the template. So your first box, and these are all, of course, word count limited, so you have a very set number, and it just kills the words that go over the end like a standard research application, as we all know. You have to summarise the impact at the beginning. Then you have to describe the underpinning research that led to it, and you get a certain number of references which um, can be followed up. Then the main bit is section four, which is the details of the impact. That takes you over most of the next side. Um, and then finally, the sources to corroborate the impact. Now, that they gave you a maximum of 10 references. So what we did in some cases was to scoop them into folders. So you will get indicative <laughs> testimony of, of you know, people who've written it and said that was fabulously useful to me in X ways. But you just fill it out the ones that are most rich or detailed. And, then, and you can only have a few words of each. But the folder is there, and they did call on it. The ref panels did ask us to make that material available to them, so it all had to be sitting in a secretary's office in case that happened. Mm. Okay, so um, as several of you have said over the course of the last day, the claims for impact are going to be complex. They're going to be of different kinds, and it's a matter of compacting them into a narrative that is rich enough um, and uh, good enough <laughs> to <coughs> hold water. So the claim here is that since First, I think you do have to do something to put the nature of the object. It's hugely familiar if you work within English studies. It's not going to be familiar to everybody, and your implied audience is multiple. So first, it's the panel assessors. Secondly, it's the rest of the higher education sector after the exercise is over because it's all put up and everybody looks at each other's to try to get leads on how to do it better next time. But thirdly, it's the politicians, or, or more, more likely the people working in the policy offices, as Jane will tell you, who have a sniff through these things, or who sit in on the hefty briefing, the, the government, um, the arm's length government um, our body that does the assessment and produces that fabulous graph like the one you showed us before of the dispersed impact across divisions of the university. But in the end, aspirationally, it's going to be the general public, so they should be able to look in theory, how far they do this, I very much doubt, but in principle, they should be able to go to these and see what their public taxpaying money has gone to. So here we go. You start by explaining, even if it seems basic, that Jane Austen has, since the late 19th century, occupied a powerful position within the English literary canon, um, and you give a little bit of colouring to it. 
Um, so her engagement, Catherine's engagement with audiences beyond academia has improved public understanding of how Austin's, this, this I really want to nail this, it's not about improving public understanding of Austin, that seems to me banal, you want to nail something more specific, of how Austin's works and life acquired the forms and significance they've had. She's enabled better informed teaching of Austin at secondary school and university level and assisted high quality educational mm -hmm. program making. Mm -hmm. So get the quality in there if you can. Mm -hmm. every, all my colleagues send me emails now and, and everybody does in every department saying, I was on the radio, I've had impact. I was on the telly, I've had impact. I'm not mocking my colleagues, I feel that way too. But it, that's not impact, that's the venue through which impact might happen unless you're assisting the radio or television producers in making high quality television. Um, and then this is the technical bit that, that came, became apparent as we were writing. Her collaborative work on the digitisation of Austin's working drafts has set new standards for the encoding of literary manuscripts, assisting literary curatorship and improving public accessibility to cultural heritage. I'm going to be perfectly honest as I go through this. I think some of these claims stand up more than others. This was 2013 that we were writing them. The standard goes up high. I would expect and there will be a similar one for 2021 that we will have to nail that claim better than you will see us doing in the next bit. Okay, so I'm not going to read it through in brief summary. What you do in the underpinning research is to explain that there is an idea out there that Austin's life has a certain form, but that form is the product of active intervention by a number of people, starting with her family. So explain the way in which a particular image of a writer came to be created and curated. That's new knowledge. It changes the subject of academic research, but it also interests a more general public. So um, putting that together um, also has an effect for how we think more widely in the biographical industry about what, what do you do when you've only got very partial evidence for a writer's life, when you have very little to go on. Okay, so there's a kind of theoretical wing to it. Right, so this is the actual academic impact. I've just pulled out a bit of it, but you can read the whole in your own time, and it will of evidence base that have been called upon. So providing new resources and forming new agendas for other academics and what you do is you pick up some sample ones but there are more in the folder of how it's been used by for example Colby College. I simply went on Google and Googled a variety of terms such as Catherine Sutherland textbook name reading list or bibliography or university course and lots of them came up so I filtered out some that gave a global scattering basically. Um, so, so Delaware, Southern Illinois as well as having wide take up. Now how do you evidence that? Well regular reprinting, 4,440 copies, not a lot for a trade book but it's a lot for an academic book. Netted revenue of that amount for OUP, they were willing to give it. The um, trade presses were not willing to give it. So what you got instead was a descriptive say that it performed well economically for Express. <laughs> Details not given and, and everybody now understands that. Um, then you get the way in which it's influenced colleagues in thinking about reception history as a new angle on Jane Austen at the time it happened. The recommended teaching text, because there, there are two academic books involved here. Again, sample places that are using it, more in the folder, its sales and its netted revenue. Now the digital ed edition, so the DH angle of this, um, is just a process of refining what, what Catherine thought had happened, what audiences had said in email and folder feedback at the end of the exercise. And remember, this is before we were all doing this. So what I like about these case studies is that they weren't manufactured, they weren't engineered in advance. So, so the feedback has a really genuine element of enthusiasm, people who wanted to get in contact. Uh, it's quite hard to replicate that in our current environment. Um, so figuring out what really happened, they're the first chance for any member of the general public to engage with these manuscript materials in high quality, again, free digital form. And then these figures are great. So you want the 4,237,000, but you also want that because that's the figure that tells you that people are coming back and actually using it, not just mm -hmm. you know, flicking through it for two seconds and going off again. There's quite a lot of skepticism about the use of hits. Um, in the sector. Um, and then between these particular dates, um, that number of news articles, again, that's about reach, but it's also a public interest signal, especially when you've got really big outlets like the BBC and so forth involved. And again, the sample notes give you a few of those at the end, um, and the on online podcast lectures. 
if any of my colleagues is having impact these days or seems likely to, I immediately ask them if they would mind putting up a free short podcast. It's usually mm -hmm. really simple. They'll be giving the same lecture on numerous occasions or a variant, so you just make sure that there's an audio recording device in the room. And this is the bit I think is, honestly, I think it's a little bit weak, but it didn't seem weak at the time. <laughs> the digital resources had important technical implications for future work in manuscript conservation and curation. So you explain that the manuscripts are, of course, too delicate and valuable. You can't have the public handling them. You don't really want them under public glass for too long. So the project set new standards for digital encoding. And here you get the technical details in there. Um, the, the hard bit to show is that there has been any real interest in that rather than yet another digital project where yet another group comes up with its own terms. But we had these two pieces of evidence. One is the British Library using it to showcase innovation in the humanities, and the other is my own institution. I'm a little bit, you know, we have this circularity here, but we used it as part of a showcasing of major research, innovation research, and the Secretary of State came along. The hardest group of people, in my experience, to get information out of about impact is government. <laughs> the very people who are asking us, as he chimes with what you said, the civil servants move on in our system, so the same person mm -hmm. will not be there a few months later, and they, the, the email address goes dead. So you simply can't, and I, you know, honestly, th the burden of doing this in accounting terms, I'm sceptical about it, I've written about it, I think, I think there are points where you really should be drawing limits, or your academic's never going to do anything new, um, and, the, you know, government would grind to a halt, so a sanity check needs to come in at some place, and that's the point which you throw up your hands, so it's a lot of throwing up your hands. Okay, I will go quickly, because I think I'm in danger of going um, over time here. No, I'm all right. I'm okay. Okay. Fine, so the other of these case studies is um, a harder one for this template to accommodate because it's based on, a really, it could have been most of the research of the, of the English faculty, everything that is put up in podcast form. So we have, like most universities, an iTunes um, uh, account or you know, a, a platform where people put up audio and visual materials. Um, so the point here needs to be that you have to show that the university is curating these materials and strategically going about, or well, the faculty is in some way strategically going about making them understandable, accessible, usable, other than them just being you know, yet another collection of stuff up on the web. So I have a fabulous colleague, Emma Smith, who works on Shakespeare. Um, we started, or this, it, for, for Oxford podcasting, started seriously with her podcast lectures from 2010. Um, on the basis of which she applied for a small fund from the university and from JISC um, and set up a curated uh, website, um, Great Writers Inspire, that sits within the iTunes um, forum. Uh, and that gathers and curates online research content targeted directly at students and teachers in secondary schools, further education, lifelong learning and universities. Combining tailor-made podcasts, curated e-books, audio talks, video files and essays is brought global audience that big. Okay. So um, the benefit claims here, the impact claims are um, for school teachers, teachers and lifelong learners. There's your download figure, so your quantitative evidence um, within the audited period. And then your sample email feedback. So the criteria for me would try to get diversity in the feedback and there is, as I say, a much larger f folder that can be accessed. Um, so the A-level student, um, first year A-level student, sorry, around 16, saying this was fantastic, now I understand how to put together an argument. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> Unsolicited as well, lovely. Um, the A, um, A, sorry, that should be A-head, not as-head, the head of a more able and talented group at a large state school, so that bit of the school that's trying to push its best students to a higher level saying that it's um, now using Wittgenstein's David illustration in the way that Emma did, and that that's gone into the classroom directly. Fabulous. And the able ones are listening to podcasts at home. And this bit I really loved, and I think it's important that it's encouraging these kids from a background where they might not think of themselves as credible candidates for application to a university like Oxford to do that. So there you go. Um, right. So you then have to fill that out in your um, long box in section four. So it's gained an audience for materials unlikely otherwise to attract notice at secondary school level. Really what you're saying is that you're putting high level academic content into the course syllabus here. Okay, and how did you do that? So it's, you know, is it just hopeful you put it out there and you know, one or two people write back to you? Well, the active curation bit comes in here where um, you have a WordPress blog, which they can access, 
captures new resources and gives you know attractive feedback and sort of um, just you know prompts to further thinking. We had paid graduate student ambassadors. The fact that we put some money into this from the faculty and the university really mattered, and it created work for them. It enabled them to make that move towards teaching from their own research base. It's very good public engagement experience for them. This bit, I really worry about how this reads to the outside world, but it's a public document. You can read it for yourselves. <laughs> OK, so Google. How did we make sure that this material really got out there? IT support in Oxford worked closely with Google, who already ranked. That's just snobbery, isn't it? Well, and <laughs> fact and experience. They already ranked Oxford highly, but they used the titles, keywords, and the sheer volume of, co of traffic going through the site to maximize the ranking in their search engine. And the outcome of that is if you put in lectures, Jane Austen, lectures, Shakespeare. I should have tried this this morning. Um, generally, well, I love lectures, Beowulf. <laughs> That's less surprising you'll almost always get Oxford English faculty at the top. I imagine Harvard will kick us off in a minute, something like that. OK, I'm going to leave you with a few problems and um, just the stuff that I work with and will be working with again a lot in the next two or three years. The language of case study presentation. This conference, understandably, because of what its aims are and the community that you represent, uses a very sox high language, if I may say so. <laughs> I would never use that language in a case study that has a potential public audience. I wouldn't even use the word stakeholder. There's a, there are, I think you need a, a really humanistic narrative language of description that retains the things that are best about those disciplines, that is rich, that's where possible funny, that might allow a space for irony occasionally. So then it's possible that I will be putting in the impact of our impact. <laughs> that the, the material I've done on the value of the humanities and its impact might conceivably make it into a next one. Well, the, we'll I'll allow for irony in that statement. I think you know, anybody reading it is going to be intelligent, especially for the assessment exercise, and will see the irony, so use it. Um, I think the second one, we just accept. I think we work terribly hard as the representatives of our institutions to make sure that what we do is different, that it's exceptional. There's a element of these case studies where you're thinking like the Google bit I just showed you, do I, do I have to give away my secrets? Um, I think that's in the spirit of it. It is a public exercise. You know, what will happen will happen. So I would favour honesty. Um, there you go. Extracting the information from commercial organisations I've already mentioned and even worse from public government bodies, that just is a problem. Again, I think you just have to accept it, but you do what you can. The, the fear of the administrator or the hostility to the administrator in academic systems and more broadly really vexes me. If our administrator or our delegated person sends an email, it goes unanswered. If I send one, it gets an answer. Mm -hmm. So there was, I, in the end, I just did nearly all of it myself. And I, I just think that's insulting to the administrative body of our universities, but it is a fact of life, I'm afraid. And sometimes you had to go back to the individual who'd had the impact, ask them to be the one because they already had the personal relationship. But you give them the words, and above all, do not script in advance. It, it just has to be, if there's anything you can say about the way this work assisted you or made a change to what you were doing, could you let us know? Don't oversell it. Um, just be honest about the indicative nature of some of the material. And then that last one, I just really want to keep in view. I think that the content, the material, what you, what the, what the level of the research was, um, especially if it's, I'll, I'll just give you one last one. One of the ones we did was King, the King James Bible, a collaborative piece of work that started with a Bodleian exhibition and then went across to the States and became huge at the Folger and a travelling exhibition where the work was really quite technical. It was about the writing of the King James Bible by committee, not by one inspired individual in a room, but a long process of you know, wrestling over the meaning of words and translation and how to create a diction that would be evocative of the, the higher purposes of that Bible. So trying to communicate what it is that's exciting and that belongs in a university and that comes out of a university and justifies that, you know, uh, that um, name on it seems to me important. There you go. I'll stop there. You can ask questions. Thank you. Thank you.